This presentation ought not to be necessary. Its message has been argued widely in articles, peer-reviewed scientific papers, newspaper, radio and TV reports, documentary films and scores of YouTube videos. Yet the aquaculture industry has stubbornly retained its most disastrous efficiency as standard, maintaining its farmed salmon in nets at sea. Informed critics, whether pro or anti-salmon farming, as operated in this far from ideal way, will detect plenty of omissions in my argument. It would take an entire documentary film to cover everything in full detail, impossible in a presentation of this sort. One aspect missing would be fair discussion of the industry's proudly proclaimed but generally unsuccessful attempts to deal with the many and various problems inherent in net cage salmon farming. Fish farming in tanks, which isolates the fish from the problems, has been developed, even for one of the most difficult of fishes, the salmon. Yet the conventional, out-of-date net cage method continues to be used in Scottish sea lochs, and it's the nets that are the fundamental problem, because they're full of holes. Before getting underway, I wish to confess my motives and vested interests, which are in no way financial. I am motivated entirely by my passion for biology, an ecologist who clearly understands the harm done to the natural world by big business corporations bent on exploiting our natural resources for their profits but to nature's detriment. My motivation has become high and vested interests are utterly zero, unless you count conscience, passion and humanism. Therefore, one, neither employment nor income governs my opinions. Two, and less embarrassed by being wrong, I have nothing to fear by holding contrary opinions. Three, I don't need to lie to make my point. Though, like anybody, I'm perfectly capable of being underinformed or mistaken. And four, while I'm free to use evidence to reach my own honest conclusions, I'm also free to change my mind or self-correct. Public criticism of salmon farming has been aimed at the industry since shortly after its introduction. Indeed, we have an extensive archive of damning newspaper cuttings that begins in the 1960s, and since those early days, followed by half a century of progressive industrialisation and expansion, public concern about this filthy, toxic industry has steadily intensified. A 2021 poll has revealed that the majority of the Scottish population is not in favour of salmon farming doubling, as proposed by the aquaculture industry, supported by the Scottish Government. As public awareness mounts, chefs increasingly refuse to serve farmed salmon, while informed customers won't eat it. At its best, farmed salmon is an inferior fish product, and at its worst, rather unpleasant, thought by some actually to be harmful, for all those reasons best avoided. We campaigners, whose numbers are increasing at a remarkable rate, are utterly confounded that the government supports this expansion after its own parliamentary inquiry in 2018 corroborated all of the problems already highlighted by its own marine research unit and coastal community groups like the Scottish Salmon Think Tank, memorably concluding that the status quo is not an option and providing clear recommendations for radical reform. Doubling the size of the industry and, of course, the associated impacts, many of which are detrimental, was not among those recommendations. In the past, had we understood the appalling consequences of bloodletting, agonising pre-anaesthesia surgery, electricity supplied through bare wires, sunray lamps, asbestos, pesticides, diesel, etc., we wouldn't have done any of it, would we? When we did discover the consequences and came up with better alternatives, we stopped putting ourselves at risk. Now we have added salmon farming to that list of avoidable horrors, but this is different. We already know the consequences of farming salmon the wrong way, in open weave nets in the sea. So why do the salmon farmers carry on farming salmon the wrong way when they know it's the wrong way to do it? Need I point out that the driving force is pathetically weak regulation, meaning that they can do pretty well as they please, and while they do so, they can be certain of fat profits. Before listing what's wrong with Scottish salmon, let's give the past a visit, beginning with bloodletting. 
For millennia, bloodletting was thought to cure a wide assortment of maladies and diseases. It didn't. Quacks were still bloodletting into the 20th century, even though truly effective treatments had been introduced long before. Now we know better, we don't do it anymore. Surgery and dentistry, although eternally necessary, used to be brutal and excruciatingly painful. Once anaesthesia had been discovered, introduced and made effective and safe, procedures of this sort were abandoned. We learnt and changed through the application of knowledge. When electricity was first installed in Edwardian homes, it was new technology and poorly understood by its users. Utterly unthinkable to us today, initially the power supply was provided through bare wires running round the house, perhaps along wooden channels, or dangling from the ceiling. Until wires were insulated, fires and electrocution were pretty well inevitable. The way Edwardians, even my parents in the 50s, connected multiple appliances to a single light socket would horrify us these days. Until hard lessons have been learnt, households like this frequently burnt the ground. We now have earth ring mains, fused plugs, trip switches, insulated cabling and other safety measures so that it's difficult for such accidents to happen anymore. Knowledge gained, often the hard tragic way, has been applied to our benefit. This advertisement boldly asserts, Real suntan, the glow of health. Innumerable uses found for ultraviolet radiation. You will look and feel vibrant, vigorous and fully alive. By subjecting your body to these rays, you are building up a reserve of health and strength to withstand disease. Fifty years later, the mail says, Post-World War II, until the 60s, sunray therapy, the therapeutic use of ultraviolet lamps, was widely championed across the UK as an antidote for everything from throat infections to acne. Only now is the medical world becoming aware of the consequences of the treatment, with scores of former patients being diagnosed with, no great surprise to us in 2021, skin cancer. My sister and I were 50s children, routinely bombarded at home with UV from the fizzing electrodes of just such a sunray lamp, because it would do us good, whether we were ill or not. They knew our eyes could be damaged, but had no notion that the rest of us might be harmed. Now that we know, and unless very foolish, as some people are, we avoid UV radiation. Ditto radium, once used as a health promoter too. Once the dangers were recognised, this dodgy treatment was stopped. Once upon a time, asbestos was the answer to insulation, fireproofing, cheap, resilient construction, etc. So many uses. It seemed to be the perfect multi-purpose material and was incorporated into almost every aspect of the built environment. Then we discovered that asbestos dust consists of fine pointed needles that cause appalling lung damage, disability and death. We discovered the same about coal dust. Having gained knowledge, we stopped using asbestos and began the long hazardous removal and replacement process still going on today. As a reasonably compassionate species, we are becoming aware that this sort of treatment of other species is wrong. Some big businesses persist with intensive battery livestock farming, but as the public become aware, they are less tolerant of such methods. Here is bad practice we have acknowledged and are part way to remedying. Even when I, as a 1960s trainee technician, worked for Fison's Agrochemicals, Pesticides were considered to be the ideal remedy for the insects, weeds and fungi that threatened our food supplies. At the same time, public awareness was rising, inspired by a single mind-changing book, Silent Spring. From that point, the world became aware of the damage we were doing to the natural environment and we began the process of cracking down on pesticide manufacture and regulation. It hasn't been easy to persuade corporations that profit from poisoning landscapes and people to change their ways, but thanks to science and public pressure, the message is at last sinking in. 
humanity learns from its disastrous mistakes and can force the profiteers to comply with new rules. Here's just one more instance of radical change in response to scientific knowledge and public awareness. We could have listed many more examples of how we humans, through ignorance, have put ourselves, other animals and the environment we all share at dire risk, learnt stark lessons from our mistakes and then revised the way we do things. Except there is one industry that stubbornly resists the obvious imperative for reform. Salmon farming. In spite of ever-increasing evidence that this form of battery farming is harming the marine environment, cruel to its fishes, produces an inferior product and might be stealthily harming the consumer, it persists, changing its practices only in order to accrue benefit to itself and shareholders or to remedy self-defeating malpractice. Here is an industry with methods arguably as reckless as bloodletting, early surgery, primitive electrical supply, hazardous radiation, asbestos and other forms of factory farming and the many other blunders we have consigned to the past. But it is clearly unwilling to undergo improvement in the dazzling light of modern knowledge that ought to make voluntary reform automatic. We've got the experience, the knowledge and the understanding but the aquaculture industry stubbornly ignores or denies all that accrued wisdom, digs in its heels and impedes progress. There's an old joke that illustrates this absurd, dangerous situation. I don't get it. Every time I put my hand in the machine like this, it chops off one of my fingers. Look, there goes another one. And if I do it again, there goes another. What's all that about then? Here's an illustrated list of 15 problems associated with farming salmon in open weave net cages in Scottish sea lochs. 1. Waste solid material. Fish faeces and leftover feed laced with the residues of the chemicals administered to the salmon delivered into the sea untreated via the holes in the nets. 2. Waste nutrients dissolved in the seawater. Mainly compounds of ammonia, nitrate and phosphate delivered into the sea untreated via the holes in the nets. Untreated solid and dissolved waste in huge quantities causes havoc in marine ecosystems and is worth spending a little time on. We begin with a bit of humour, but the intention is not so much laughter as irony, and it's not intended to underplay the severity of the real environmental impacts. What about the privies? Well... What we're talking about in, um, privy terms is the very latest in front wall fresh air orifices combined with a wide capacity gutter installation below. You mean you crap out of the window? Yes. Well, in that case, we'll definitely take it. Maybe that was a wee step beyond reality, but by only a smidgen. Apparently, in the past, it was quite usual to tip wastewater and even the contents of chamber pots out of the window to the streets below. You'd think that enlightenment might put an end to such unpleasantness, wouldn't you? These days, we abhor this sort of thing. In civilised Britain, nobody would dream of actually dumping untreated waste straight into the sea as a routine practice of their industry, would they? Oh yes, they would. But we can't see it happening when it all goes on underwater. Even though we're now in the 21st century, some people still just guardy loo all their sewage, solid and liquid, untreated, into the sea locks of Scotland, free of cost and conscience. And our legislators permit and encourage it. Some of us think that's a bad idea. Some figures. Incredibly, every year, every one of between 200 and 250 12 cage salmon farms dump approximately 1,000 tonnes of solid faecal waste. That's more than 200,000 tonnes of, I'll say it only once, shit per annum, and dissolved ammonia, nitrates, and phosphates, exceeding the entire sewage of Scotland, untreated into Scotland's sea lochs. Solids sink to the seabed to smother and poison everything there, 
while the dissolved nutrients and excess pesticides pollute the water. There's a lot more one could say about this extraordinary outrage, but I want to keep it brief here. The details available elsewhere. What does the seabed under a salmon farm look like? Under natural circumstances, a bit like this. Salmon farmers favour calm waters where fine sediments settle and where biologically rich burrowed mud communities predominate. Their preference to site their fish farms above such habitats is clearly shown by this pair of distribution maps. Note that in Ireland most salmon farms are located in the southwest, where it's rather like western Scotland. The coincidence is striking and occupation comprehensive, yet the regulatory authorities have stated we therefore advise that the area of this habitat which is likely to be affected by this proposal would not be considered of regional or national importance. We dare to differ. Under the cages of a salmon farm, the seabed becomes obliterated. Suitable habitat for only mat-forming filamentous bacteria of the genus Begiatoa and zillions of minute capitella worms. But we have an underwater camera here and we're just going to throw it down and we're kind of in a control site so it's a clean area away from the fish farms we're going to throw it down and see what the bottom looks like. It's a really neat, neat habitat. Look at all the scallops. We've got squat lobsters, spot prawn, big sun star, lots and lots of uh, mussels, regular stars, bat stars. This is just a fabulous habitat. There's all kinds of stuff down here. Just yeah, this this is what a really rich ocean bottom should look like. It's just full of stuff. The squat lobsters sitting back in the holes, taking off as the camera gets close. Cyrus Rocks Farm, we're going to throw the camera down. We just checked out the control site a little ways down the channel. So the, the camera really is our eyes to the, to the bottom down there, what's going on. So we're going to see what it looks like. It looks pretty close to dead, doesn't it? We're not seeing much except a whole lot of just sediment down here. This is not a healthy bottom. This isn't a, bot a bottom that you'd want to see in British Columbia. This is pretty much just sediments with a few dead shells. It's remarkable by its lack of life. It's very close to a desert, but it's a man-made desert. It's a pretty sad sight. The contrast between this area and the control area further up the channel couldn't be more... Have we, or rather they, the salmon farmers and the regulators, learnt nothing? Three, waste and excess therapeutic chemicals administered in food, therefore deposited with faeces, or in the nets and dispersed, or would it be more correct to say disposed of, in the surrounding water. Supposedly this waste becomes diluted rapidly to negligible concentration and therefore we are expected to believe, guaranteeing negligible environmental impacts. Does my voice betray a degree of doubt? Is that reasonable? You show me pollution, and I will show you people who are not paying their own way, people who are stealing from the public, people who are getting the public to pay their costs of production. All environmental pollution is a subsidy. 4. Infestations of sea lice, multiplied to catastrophic levels within the nets on high-density salmon, which they eat alive, requires treatment with very nasty pesticides, which contaminate the seabed, the seawater and the salmon. And five, sea lice become resistant to treatment. Caged salmon, and therefore the aquaculture industry, are plagued by pests and diseases. Fish nibbling sea lice are particularly virulent, so that salmon farmers have to fight dirty in their attempts to control them. They use an array of horribly toxic chemotherapeutants, the efficacy and environmental fate of which are beyond highly questionable. They also have some non-chemical methods, such as the thermolyser, a warm bath which has been known to cook the salmon alive, and when it doesn't, quite, the procedure kills plenty of them anyway. Then they use cleaner fish, which are supposed to eat the lice. 
They too are questionable due to limited effectiveness, ecological problems caused by their being harvested from the wild, and, as usual, sheer cruelty. Sometimes little stinging jellyfish, Pelagia noctiluca, get into the nets in shoals. As some fish farmers have found out the hard way, they seem to enjoy killing captive salmon. Here are just three of the chemotherapeutants used today. Many have been abandoned or prohibited. Hydrogen peroxide and formaldehyde are also used. As its latest response to serial failure to evict the sea lice, the industry has begun trialling the notorious neonicotinoid pesticide imidocloprid. Unlike other sea lice remedies, emamectin benzoate is administered to infested salmon in their feed. The concentration, 0.02%, is substantially lower than is used on land, 0.5%, but once devoured it goes straight to source, none wasted as with crop spraying other than in uneaten pellets. If you can find hazard warning notes, they're alarming. This is very toxic stuff which manufacturers prefer not to stress. But here's one. Environmental hazards. This pesticide is toxic to fish, birds, mammals and aquatic invertebrates. Do not apply directly to water, to areas where surface water is present or to intertidal areas below the mean high water mark. One might speculate about this stuff. The toxin is ingested. Its purpose is to be eaten by the sea lice which it kills, so it must migrate to the surface muscles and skin. Therefore, en route, it must necessarily suffuse the entire fish. Is it possible that residues persist in the salmon flesh at slaughter? We are uncertain and viewers are left to reach their own conclusions. Emamectin resistance has become a serious problem to the salmon farmers who have to use equally nasty alternatives or pesticide cocktails. 6. Diseases Amoebic gill disease, infectious salmon anemia, Pastorella skyensis infection and others reach epidemic proportions in cages populated with high-density salmon. The favoured treatments use toxic therapeutic chemicals, euphemistically referred to as medicines, that contaminate surrounding seawater and probably the salmon. Diseased salmon become sick, deformed, blind, etc., and if not harvested or culled, die very slowly and horribly. 7. Disease organisms become resistant to treatment. Eight, impacts on wild salmon. Low levels of sea lice are normal in seawater. However, in the presence of salmon farms, huge concentrations of sea lice greatly above natural levels emanate from and extend far beyond the cages. They infest wild salmon and sea trout and are probably responsible to a significant degree for the imminent extinction of the wild salmon for which Scottish rivers were once famous. This is an environmental impact of salmon farming for which the farmers vehemently deny any responsibility. The salmon fishers equally passionately disagree, as does evidence. 9. Cruelty to the salmon. Salmon are cultivated under conditions that match onshore battery farming. Denied their natural migratory life cycle and for two long years unable to swim properly, painfully debilitated by pests and diseases, kept alive when injured, sick or deformed, all combined to cause massive suffering and mortalities. It's been filmed.
10. Death. In Scotland in 2019, more than 25,000 tonnes of caged salmon, that's 13.5% of total production, died prematurely. Depending on size, that would have been between 10 and 20 million dead fish. They are transported across the country to incinerators, rendering factories or landfill. Some become pet food. The stench as the dead salmon pass by, here one of the many stinking trucks passing my home, or after a not uncommon mishap like this, is terrible. Where salmon die in an inconveniently remote location, for instance the Outer Isles, alternative but not necessarily ideal disposal methods are employed. Do we think that shoveling them into mass graves in sand dunes where tourists go is a terribly good idea? 11. Mass escapes and genetic introgression. Fish farm storm wrecks have become quite commonplace. Escaped salmon interbreed with what's left of the wild salmon, corrupting their genetic integrity. Twelve, feeding fish to fishes. In order to taste anything remotely like salmon, farmed fish are fed on a diet that contains fish oil and meal obtained by catching huge harvests of smaller fishes to the extreme detriment of wild stocks of anchovy, anchovetta, capelin, sardines, etc. Huge fleets of industrial fishing boats either net or literally suck entire shoals taken ashore to factories where they are turned into fish meal and oil to feed the world's battery chickens and farmed salmon. These fishes are running out and the industry is turning its attention to, for instance in Europe, sand eels and elsewhere, even krill, the very foundation of marine food webs. The salmon feed industry has been catastrophic for the human communities, particularly along the coasts of South America and Africa, who rely on small-scale fishing for their very livelihoods. We've had cruelty to salmon, now cruelty to wild fishes and cruelty to people. But it's quite clear that the aquaculture industry cares little. You're encouraged to watch the 10-minute video The Greed of Feed. The link's below in the video notes. Cheap farmed salmon is now the fish of choice for millions the world over. But farmed fish need to be fed with significant volumes of wild fish. In Peru, anchovies are fished industrially for processing into fish meal for use in salmon feed. 13. Irregularities in planning applications due to incompetence, bad science and sometimes, how shall I put it, creative interpretation of data? This is just one of the fish farming topics discussed with reference to some pretty shocking real-life examples in the not-for-profit book Holes, only £3 from Amazon. This little book was published back in 2013 as an information resource for a highland coastal community confronted with four planning applications to site fish farms in their local lochs. At first we had zero knowledge, but we researched and learnt. Armed with information, the community led by the Scottish Salmon Think Tank and the local community council responded with true authority and the applications were summarily refused. Read the story in the article linked in the notes below. Eight years later, the book isn't entirely up to date, but with salmon farming having changed so little, it's not far off. 14. Inferior farmed salmon on the fishmonger's slab. As the salmon farming industry has expanded, wild Scottish salmon populations have declined. True wild Scottish salmon is now too rare to be eaten and seems doomed to extinction unless something is done soon to promote its recovery. Such measures should surely include strict regulation of salmon farming. Of course, flying in the face of a wealth of scientific literature, the industry denies any responsibility. At the wedding of Henry Pratt, that's the eponymous Pratt of the Argus, the Cucumber Man and restaurateur Pratt à Manger and Diana Hargreaves. The meal was cold but delicious. Rough pâté followed by Scotch salmon and tarragon chicken. The salmon was the proper stuff, not the farmed kind that poisons lochs and dulls the taste buds. The single factor responsible for most of the foregoing 14 
is the holes that define the cages in which the farmed salmon spend two years swimming slowly and aimlessly round and round until ready for slaughter, or, for a quarter of them, a slow, miserable, premature death caused by debilitating pests and diseases. The holes are the gateway for huge quantities of outgoing pollutants and the exchange of epidemics with the natural world, both ways. These are problems which could be solved at a stroke if the holes were to be eliminated. Is that enough to worry about? Do you think that 15 deficiencies ought to be sufficient to persuade the Scottish Government to take control of salmon aquaculture and reform it into a safe, sensible industry? In spite of entrenched denials of practicability promulgated by spokespersons for the established aquaculture industry, alternatives to farming salmon at sea in nets are being developed and implemented. Land-based salmon farms are being built around the world, many of which are in full production. There isn't a hint of similar innovation planned for Scotland, well, not while waste disposal is free and detrimental environmental impacts are considered by Scottish Government regulatory agencies to be trivial. Need I say that trivial they are not? The Scottish National Party, currently the majority in the Scottish Parliament and likely to remain in power after the imminent May election, published its manifesto in April 2021. Policies for the future indicate no change to salmon aquaculture and we must expect that doubling the size of the industry including business as usual in nets, will proceed. Details will follow in a short additional video. What about a remedy? Well, all, yes, all of the problems for which the holes in the nets are responsible, problems not only for nature but also significantly for the industry itself, can be eliminated if land-based tank systems are used instead of those conventional cages in the sea. Here's a comparison. Please pause if you need time to examine this table. We encourage you, if interested, to explore the progress of closed containment, aka Recirculating Aquaculture Systems, RAS, in which salmon are now being successfully raised in tanks. Very soon, these people will be supplying 90,000 tonnes of salmon per year from their single land-based farm in Florida. Compare that with the reported total output from Scotland's more than 200 sea-polluting farms in 2019, just over 200,000 tonnes. As more and more tank-raised salmon are produced, will the Norwegians who refuse to update, for it is they who own most of Scotland's salmon industry, be able to compete? For decades, wild salmon have been struggling with what ocean aquaculture leaves behind. Fish waste, escaped salmon, viruses and bacteria, pesticides, antibiotics, sea lice, microplastics. It gets messy, and the debate about whether humans can farm salmon sustainably and responsibly has been difficult to navigate. But the water surrounding the aquaculture industry doesn't have to be so murky. One company has been working towards a future that includes flavorful, sustainably farmed fish. Fish that cannot damage or alter the ocean environment. Norwegian company Atlantic Sapphire has invested $250 million towards a large-scale aquaculture project based 100% on land. We're a 10-year-old company and we've already farmed 25 generations of fish in Denmark. It's been a great learning experience and as of today, we're harvesting three days a week, uh, every day consistently in Denmark. So this is not a proof of concept. The fish is actually already available in many retailers in the US and Canada. But this method for salmon production is still far from perfect. It's still battery farming, in which decent fish welfare can be very difficult to maintain. Also, the fishes would still be denied their fast-swimming migratory lifestyle. They would need to be provided with feed that doesn't cause the over-exploitation of wild fish stocks and malnutrition of the coastal communities that depend on fishing locally for their food. And unless the public can be persuaded to accept pallid grey salmon, they would still have to be fed on dye to make them look palatable. The major advantage would be that it would replace the current filthy setup in Scotland, allowing the once pristine marine environment of Western Scotland to recover from 50 years of reckless pollution. More to the point, the pens remain essentially the same as they've always been. 
They may have gone from square to round, been strengthened to fend off the seals and a few other modifications, but they're still full of holes, the cause of all the problems that accompany salmon farming in nets. The salmon aquaculture industry persistently claims that it is improving its methods. If referring to conversion to land-based tank systems, that's a fair boast. But that doesn't account for the big corporations that farm salmon along the west coast of Scotland, who are not budging, or barely so. They claim to be innovating, but truly significant change has not been evident for decades. In Scotland, salmon farmers are offered no incentives to innovate. Indeed, the Scottish Government persists with its support for doubling the size of the industry by 2030, ignoring the advice it gave itself that the status quo is not an option. Salmon aquaculture practice is not innovative, it's stagnant. Here are just four out of many indications of that stagnation. 1. The continuing battle against the sea lice and epidemics that have plagued the industry since its inception. Why did Ian Anderson, one of the first fish farmers who features prominently in the earliest of our collective press cuttings, pull out of Loch Slapin? Local intelligence has it that sea lice became too heavy a burden and were threatening to ruin his business. Not recently, but almost 30 years ago, and these days the situation is no better. Arguably, it's worse. 2. A video produced by the American government's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration sums it all up, if unintentionally. Although purporting to show innovations in salmon aquaculture, in fact it depicts an industry that hasn't changed for years. The farm off the coast of Maine that they feature could be any of the 200 plus in Scotland. Incidentally, the video contains scenes that, again unintended, I'm sure, reveal some uncomfortable truths about salmon farming. During the first seconds of the title sequence, a salmon swims into view. Its snout is bare of skin and its fins are ragged, just like those in pictures taken secretly in Scottish fish farms of their sea louse nibbled, disease-ridden captives. This neither represents the energetic wild salmon nor farmed salmon as farmers would have us imagine them. It's a scene of abject tragedy. Actually, I don't think it's a farmed salmon anyway. I think they've got a bit of footage of a wild salmon that's on its last legs. A bit further on, an avuncular fish farm employee is seen leaning on the side of a cage. He languidly observes, Healthy, happy fish. Fifteen seconds later, his words are illustrated by one of his charges swimming by with a scar where its dorsal fin should be. This is not good PR. 3. Massive mortalities on salmon farms continue to be reported and the trucks transporting the dead fish continue to trundle stinkily past my home, which is situated alongside the main road from the salmon farming hotspots, the Hebridean Islands, the Isle of Skye and Westeros, to points of disposal far away. And finally four, profit protection and sheer stubbornness. Whenever challenged with a suggestion salmon farming should adapt to closed containment, spokespersons act out a pathetic broken wing display. They assert either that it doesn't work or it's too expensive. Its most recent iteration was reported in the Sunday Times of the 25th of April 2021. Spokesman Hamish MacDonald said, using closed containment on land for the full marine phase Growing salmon from smolt to market size remains commercially unviable. First, we need only refer to Atlantic Sapphire among many to expose that oh-so-transparent falsehood. Second, we aren't bothered about commercial viability, which we consider to be subsidiary to the well-being of the marine environment. Of course, what he meant by unviable, as did his predecessors who routinely used to promulgate this unpersuasive defence, is that the industry would have to dig deep into its profits in order to make that inconvenience change. We remind them that salmon farming has, for half a century, paid nothing for their waste disposal, while the environment has. The time has come for the industry to reinvest that massive saving in cleaning up. The salmon farmers have caused the problems. It's their responsibility to provide the solution. We all know what it is. Tanks! because they haven't got holes in them. Well. 
Will they ever learn? When will they ever learn?